Kia ora koutou katoa. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll provide a, an update on the vaccine rollout, uh, a bit more information on uh, vaccine, um, the vaccine program for our border workers in particular, uh, and also uh, have a, provide a few more details on managed isolation uh, and the pilot that we announced earlier this week. But first, I'll hand over to Dr Bloomfield for the update on today's cases. Thank you, Minister. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. So today we're reporting 45 new cases uh, of COVID-19 in the community. All are in the Auckland region. It takes our total number of cases in this outbreak to 1,230. It won't be lost on you that this is the largest number of cases we've had for some time. So I will go into a bit of detail based on the most up-to-date information that I have. First, 33 of these new cases are known to be household or other close contacts of existing cases and many of them have been isolating throughout their infectious period, either at home or in an MIQ facility. Uh, of these, 26 are household contacts, and 12, for example, come from just two households where there are six in each. Now, many of these cases were expected. On Monday, I indicated there were between 45 and 50 cases at that time likely to arise amongst household and other close contacts who had already been identified. We're seeing some of those come through in the number today. Now, presently, there are 12 cases that are unlinked and interviews are underway, but what I would say, for six of those, there are already potential links visible. Now that Auckland is at alert level three, some of our cases today may have been working in essential or permitted businesses. These are the ones we haven't yet uh, interviewed or are being interviewed during their infectious periods. This emphasises the importance of everyone in Auckland continuing to abide by Alert Level 3 measures. They are there for a reason, and this includes mask wearing and, importantly, minimising contact with others, staying in your bubble as much as possible. And alongside that, I want to make a call out to all employers in Auckland to actively support any of your staff who are not yet vaccinated to get vaccinated today. So while the overall number today is obviously a lot higher, it is important to note many of these cases are linked to the, our existing cases and in some sense they were expected. But even more important is that we found these cases because people have come forward and been tested. This is essential for us to know what we are dealing with and high levels of testing across Auckland tell us that. So thank you to everyone again who has been or is being tested. Our health staff from the Māori and Pacific providers in Auckland, our public health unit and the DHBs continue to work with households and groups to support them to stay at home when they are isolating and many other agencies are involved in providing support as part of that. Yesterday I mentioned as part of the ongoing uh, outbreak response in Auckland, we are extending our surveillance testing to businesses where workers are permitted to be at work during Alert Level 3. We're asking workers, particularly in construction, hospitality and retail sectors, to get two tests at least five days apart over the next couple of weeks, whether they have symptoms or not. This is just part of our overall testing to help us identify whether there are any chains of transmission out there that we are not yet aware of and help us uh, assess the level of risk there might be there around undetected community transmission. I would like to emphasise this testing is voluntary. It is not required. But I'm encouraging employers to support your workers to participate in this. In addition to GPs and urgent care clinics, there are 21 uh, community testing centres open today around the uh, Auckland region, so no one should have to wait very long at all for a swab. And some larger workplaces also have testing available on site for their staff. As this is surveillance testing, staff are not required to isolate while awaiting the result of the test they can continue to work unless, of course, they have any symptoms. The groups who are already undertaking surveillance testing, such as permitted workers who are crossing the alert level boundaries or border workers, do not need to undertake this additional testing. An update on the Tauranga wastewater result. Uh, the Bay of Plenty DHB has seen a slight increase in testing numbers with around 400 people tested so far. However, we would like to see more, and I'm just emphasising for anyone in that Tauranga, Mount Monganui region, if you have any symptoms, then please go and, get a, go and get a test. Indeed, if you have been at a location of interest also. 
there is uh, extended testing and testing hours across Tauranga today. There is plenty of capacity there. Uh, I'd also like to urge the people of Tauranga, indeed anywhere across the Motu, if you haven't already been vaccinated, now is your opportunity to do that. In Tauranga, there are plenty of sites available today where you can just walk in and be vaccinated. Go for it. Now, one of the cases being reported today is an individual who attended the emergency department at Waitakere Hospital on Saturday the 25th for a non-COVID-related condition. They became unwell the next day with COVID-related symptoms and were subsequently tested with a positive result returned yesterday afternoon. As part of the usual precautions, as the uh, person's infectious period included Saturday, a small number of staff have been stood down and the public health unit up there is following up directly with a small number of patients who were in the vicinity of this person when they were in ED. Uh, that person is now no longer requiring uh, hospital level care and has been, uh, is going to a managed isolation facility. And finally, uh, a shout out, it's great to see Canterbury businesses joining forces for a COVID-19 vaccination campaign that aims to get 90% of eligible Cantabrians vaccinated by Labour weekend, which means they will be fully vaccinated for Christmas. The DHB has thrown its support behind the campaign. Currently in Canterbury, there are 80% of eligible people having had at least one dose or being booked for their vaccination. So keep up the good work, Canterbury, and I'm sure other, other provinces around the country will recognise this as an opportunity to take it to Canterbury and beat them there, as well as uh, give them a good run for their money during the NPC this year. Back to you, Minister. Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. Uh, moving on to vaccinations, 44,000 doses of vaccine were administered across the country yesterday. And I do know that there's huge interest in the number of first doses uh, and the way we're tracking there. Nationally, uh, we have now around 78% of the eligible 12 plus population uh, having had their first shot. And we're now seeing real growth in second doses and consequently full vaccination. In the last seven days, the number of Kiwis that have had their, se uh, their second dose has increased by almost 200,000 to 1.8 million. That's 44%, uh, so we're getting close to half the eligible population being fully vaccinated. I can't overstate the importance of those 1.8 million people now being fully vaccinated. It is a significant step uh, towards the ongoing protection of New Zealand against COVID-19. Second dose vac vaccination bookings indicate that we're going to see a peak of second doses around mid-October, six to eight weeks after the record numbers of first doses that we saw in that late August, early September period. 55% of Māori have had their first dose, 29% their second. Uh, amongst Pacific people, 71% have had their first dose and 40% their second. Uh, the 92% uh, of over 65s deserve a particular shout out for getting their first dose. 82% uh, of them have had their second. Uh, for those aged between 40 and 64, uh, the numbers are sitting at 82% uh, for first dose and 50% 50, uh, 50 for second. In the Auckland metro area, a total of 1,868,161 doses have been administered. 682,000 people uh, have, had their, had, have had both doses. As at midnight tomorrow, the requirement will come into force for all border workers uh, and roles where they might come into contact with COVID-19 to be vaccinated. This greater protection at our border gives us confidence that those people who are going to work and doing jobs uh, that potentially bring them into greater risk of contact with COVID aren't then going to get sick or die from COVID or pass that on to other people. Uh, if we've got another international ship, for example, present uh, with the virus in our waters, or if we have an incursion at our airport or at an MIQ facility, there's high rates of vaccination provide us all with that much more assurance. It also, of course, reduces the possibility of community transmission uh, of COVID-19. So I'm incredibly proud of the work that our border workers have been doing to ensure that they are getting on with the job and getting vaccinated to protect themselves and to protect others. As at this morning, 98% of active border workers have been vaccinated with at least one dose and 93% are fully vaccinated. That includes 95% of our port workers, which is a significant advance from July uh, when that number stood at 55%. There's been a lot of work done with that group to ensure that they're given good, accurate information so they can make informed decisions around vaccination, and we are seeing much bigger 
rates of vaccination amongst those workers as a result of that. So I want to thank everybody that has been involved in that effort, from our DHBs to the, the employers, the unions, uh, the border workers themselves, uh, a big thank you. I do want to remind anyone who works at the border but is yet to be vaccinated that they now have 24 hours until midnight tomorrow night to get their first vaccination if they wish to continue to work at the border. Today I can also confirm uh, what I announced on Friday. The Cabinet has now uh, formally signed off the funding for a new MIQ facility at the Elms Hotel in Christchurch and work is underway to get that stood up as quickly as possible. There are, of course, a lot of complexities to work through when standing up a new MIQ facility, but the Elms will add uh, another 85 rooms, uh, which is a welcome addition to our MIQ network. Moving finally to the self-isolation pilot, expressions of interest for uh, the self-isolation pilot open at 9am tomorrow morning, and we'll be looking for 150 participants across Auckland and Christchurch. These locations both have uh, obviously international airports, but also established MIQ systems and support uh, networks that have been set up for regular arri international arrivals, and that's why we've chosen Auckland and Christchurch. Participants will have to self-isolate for 14 days in an approved residence. Uh, for this pilot, it has to be a standalone residence, have no shared ventilation system, and be within 50 kilometres of either Auckland or Christchurch airport by road. Uh, it must also have cellular coverage. No visitors will be allowed on those premises while the people are isolating, aside from medical staff for testing purposes or those attending to someone in an emergency situation like a fire uh, or ambulance people or uh, tradespeople if there are uh, critical things that endanger the health and safety of people isolating. Those isolating will have to provide their own food and supplies. Contactless deliveries are allowed. They will be monitored through smartphone technology and regular random phone calls to verify compliance will be made. Participants will be charged $1,000 to cover basic costs like transport and the other associated costs with the pilot. Uh, that is less than what they would pay if they were in MIQ because, of course, it is a less intensive service and we're not providing them with food. When they return to New Zealand, participants will have to have a negative pre-departure test. Uh, they'll be screened and tested on arrival in New Zealand as well. That's what we currently do uh, for those who are entering into our MIQ facilities. Now happy to open up for questions. So Jessica and then Tover, I believe, is the routine. Minister, what does it mean for uh, Level 3 for Auckland? And did you consider going up to Level 4? Will this 45 number make you look at extending Level 3? I think as the Director-General has um, just outlined, we, we do expect from time to time that there will be uh, little peaks and troughs uh, in our case investigation process. And the fact that such a significant proportion of the cases we saw today are people who are already known contacts, already isolating, uh, that's, that does mean that while it's a bigger number, uh, it's less concerning than if it was a, the number that big of unknown uh, people coming, uh, testing positive. What is this people like? in Auckland who are feeling pretty deflated by these numbers watching this? Do you, I mean, sh should they be prepared for a, for longer lockdowns, or is this just a is this just a one off? Look, I think um, what we've said right from the beginning of this outbreak, and and as it with every other outbreak we've dealt with, it's not so much the number of cases, but the nature and characteristics of the cases that we're seeing that inform alert level decisions. So yes, this is a big number. It's a sobering number. I don't think anybody. Um, uh, who's involved in this process would be celebrating a number like the one we're seeing today. Um, but the fact that such a significant proportion of those are known contacts or household contacts does point a little bit to the nature of this particular outbreak that we're now dealing with, uh, and that it's concentrated in larger households, for example. Um, and so we, we do expect from time to time that there will be blips. Now, we have seen blips already in this outbreak, where we are, we've, we've had a, a bad day, where we've had a number of a larger number of cases and then it's gone down again. So uh, I would encourage people not to read too much into it at this point. You know, I think we've still got to hold our nerve here um, and uh, we are still, you know, pursuing uh, COVID-19. We're still aiming to run this into the ground. Tova. The result of a gang cluster? Uh, I'll ask the Director-General if he wanted to add further comments to that, but it is, uh, in part, the fact that we've got, you know, 30, 33 household or known close contacts, it is a sign that the contact tracing system is working and that a significant portion of the risk of these this bigger number of cases is already isolated. Is it a gang? 
Uh, could I, no, it's not actually. Uh, so there are two things happening here. Uh, the first is that a number of our cases over uh, recent, the recent week have been in large households, and I talked about two households here where there are six um, other family members in those, each of those two households that are now have become cases. Uh, on Monday, as I mentioned, 45 to 50 cases that we were expecting to come through. Well, that number's dropped down to 15, so we're seeing quite a number of those have been picked up through the routine, either day five or day 12 testing. But second is, quite a proportion of our cases at the moment are among uh, groups of people who are in transitional or emergency housing. And the teams are working uh, very hard with a range of agencies to um, uh, to support those people. And, that's, and, and those are people who, by the very nature of the housing arrangements they are in, are moving around for a range of reasons and may have been through alert level four and three. Uh, and one of the things the team in Auckland is doing is it's identified uh, all the, what they might term high risk sort of transitional emergency housing or hostel settings, particularly in South Auckland. And over the next few days, they're going to be going out and testing all the people in those settings. I'm not asking that to stigmatise anybody. It's because we have heard it from the source that, that there is a, a large group of people who are uh, COVID cases who are, were part of gangs. So I just wonder how much of a problem gangs, given the access to perhaps a gang pad, would be more difficult, how much of a problem gangs are posing to the South Bank. We did have a group of households about two or three weeks ago where there were members, uh, where members of those households had gang affiliation. And we've had um, a lot of engagement, including with the, the, the leadership of those gangs, and that's seen very good uh, take up of testing because, and we know that because there were specific surveillance codes given to people who may have had contact uh, with those uh, households. Uh, and those are not the households that we are seeing these residual cases coming through from. Well, just saying that, um, is saying that what we're doing in Auckland, quote, isn't working and that we, quote, could be losing control of this outbreak. What do you think, Minister? Um, no, I, I don't agree with that at all. Um, we are dealing with, you know, larger groups of people, so larger families, and that does mean that we do see some larger case numbers on some days. Uh, but our contact tracing system is still working effectively to ring fence the risk. Uh, and I, again, I just reiterate to people, um, you need to, we need to hold our nerve here, uh, and, and uh, you know we will see days where we see higher, higher numbers of cases. Uh, this is a, as you said, this is a fairly sobering number. What was your reaction when you first saw it? Um, look, every day uh, when, the, when the case number comes through, it typically comes through, uh, the overnight case number comes through to me m sort of mid-morning-ish. Um, I look for that, and, you know, single-digit days are always, you know, slightly brighter days than ones when you're dealing with a big, uh, with a bigger double-digit number. Um, but having said that, um, it's the next bit of information that's the most important, which is what's the nature of those cases. That's a fairly diplomatic answer. You must have been concerned when you saw such a, such a monumental jump. Um, look, any increase in COVID cases is, is of concern. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't celebrate anybody getting COVID-19, uh, but ultimately it is the nature of the cases that is probably more important uh, at this point than the number of cases. Joe. Just uh, going back to the reflection made, Dr. Blinter, to the transitional social housing, do you have any indication of what vaccination rates are like in those communities? No, I don't have that information. Uh, we've talked uh, at some of these stand-ups around um, particular efforts that have gone in around homeless people. Now, that's a different group, again, from people in this accommodation. Uh, what I will say is that as part of the testing that is going to go out uh, the, uh, from the Auckland team, they're going to be following that up with vaccination as well with uh, those people in these uh, arrangements across uh, Auckland. So there are around 40 that they've determined are medium to high risk are going in with testing first and then following up with vaccination. Minister, 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 Minister Housing, um, I was just trying to ask about the, um, the comment this morning from the Pacific Director of the Ministry of Health saying that the outbreak appears to have seated itself in gang environments and among the homeless. And um, we've had commentary about those groups being harder to reach by traditional contact tracing methods. Are they eluding the contact? Are they hard to, uh, how, how big is that blind spot and what are we? Um, are they resistant to the door knocking? I know the stats that were given yesterday where only nine of the 100 households uh, that were knocked in Clover Park actually agreed to be tested. So uh, I think they're different from the households in Clover Park. I think that's a different uh, thing there. And we have had a number of households that have been in Clover Park. So saying we've seen very high rates of testing. Clover Park's leading the suburbs in, in Auckland for in terms of testing rate. 
Most definitely, it requires a different approach uh, to uh, engaging with and following up with and supporting uh, people who are in transitional and emergency accommodation. And you can imagine there is a range of reasons why they are there. So they require a range of health and social supports. Uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of the work the teams are doing in Auckland to actually pivot the response away from the traditional contact tracing approach to um, working very closely with the Māori and uh, Pacific health providers to reach into these communities. And, uh, you know, the, the fact is here, all these cases were found because people agreed to be tested and they are getting information around the contacts then. But, of course, because they can be a bit itinerant, then that does make it more of a challenge. Henry, so what would you estimate say, what would more 40-odd 40 40 cases to come a day? Is that from the sort of rough sleeper gang environments, or are they from different subclusters? Uh, so on Monday, I referred to around 45 to 50. That was uh, if you looked at all the people who were very close or household contacts who were isolating, and you looked at the conversion rate that we've had over the... Um, over this outbreak, it was an estimate of how many cases we would expect. It was 45 to 50 on Monday. It's now down to around 15 because a number of our cases today are ones that were picked up through the day five and day 12 testing of people who were already isolating. Henry. Minister, if um, New Zealand, if Auckland was still on level four, would you see this many cases today? Possibly. Do you agree with that? Do you yeah, agree? I, I agree, possibly, and it goes to the nature of, you know, as I said yesterday, there are only a small number of active subclusters here. We, we've we got uh, over 20 different subclusters. Most of those are, are, are finished, you know, we're calling them dormant because they're not yet closed, or are well controlled. There's just a small number of active subclusters. Those were there even when we made the gave the advice to go down to alert level three, and the control measures that are um, in place are identical to what we would have. You are, you are, seeing, you are seeing infections within workplaces, right? And there are a lot more people at work. There's 400,000 people at work in Auckland now because of level three. Does it, does it follow that surely some of those infections must be in workplaces that would, under level four, not be active? Well, yes, there are more workplaces open now, and hence why we have added in the surveillance testing of people who are now going out into those permitted workplaces exactly for this purpose. It's part of our, our control measures. Click, okay, clear, clear, and then we'll, and then we'll head your way. Um, a police inspector has been investigated for crossing the Auckland boundary to drive people to a tangi. Do you have any further details on that or any uh, views on that? No, I don't. It is ultimately a matter for the police, but I certainly expect the police to be following the same rules as everybody else. They are there to enforce the rules, but they also have to follow the rules too. Why is it a matter for the police if he's breaching Dr Bloomfield's orders? Um, because ultimately a question around whether the police and themselves are following the rules is a matter for the police, um, and if they're not, then that is also a matter for the police. Just Just additional yeah. housing, Dr Bloomfield, yesterday you mentioned that the COVID cases um, among people living in emergency housing or transitional housing was kind of centred around one housing group. Do you think that's the case in Auckland? Has it moved beyond and kind of spread to other boarding houses, or is it still focused on, on that one? Uh, uh, it, just to reiterate uh, the comment yesterday, or just to clarify the comment yesterday, it's more than one sort of transitional accommod accommodation setting, but there are links between them. Uh, and also to households that are not uh, transitional accommodation um, uh, places. And so, Bloomfield, oh, Mr. Hickens, yeah. um, uh, are you aware and are you concerned that a volunteer tested positive at, uh, who was working at a pop-up vaccination drive through after mixing and eating with other volunteers? Is, is there any thought to stricter protocols on that? Um, look, any person testing positive for COVID-19, uh, particularly where they picked that up in the community, is a, 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 of concern. Um, our vaccination centres have very strict infection prevention and control measures in place for everybody who is there, whether it's people who are paid to be there, people who are volunteering, or people who are coming forward to be vaccinated. But I'll ask the Director-General to add to that. Uh, yes, the, that was... Uh event was assessed, risk assessed by the public health unit and there were just there was a small number of people that that uh, volunteer who tested positive had I think eaten with a morning tea or lunch and they were treated as close contacts and have, are isolating and being tested but they, those were the only people who were judged to be um, in any way a close contact and requiring follow up. We'll come to touch over in the Dr Bloomfield, the ministry was made aware by ESR on Monday that there was um, positive results for wastewater in Tauranga. Why didn't you tell the public until yesterday? Uh, yes, that result came through late on uh, Monday night. 
uh, late on Monday. Uh, and our usual protocol with a positive wastewater test is actually to do a repeat test before we do anything. We discussed it on uh, Monday morning, including with the local public health unit, and made the decision uh, and got in place uh, that morning the testing, and then announced it uh, yesterday morning, uh, yesterday, which was after we just after we made the decision to do that. So the National Party today released its comprehensive um, opening up policy, including um, opening up the borders when we reach 80 to 85 percent vaccination rates, ending lockdowns at 70 to 75 percent vaccination rates. They've challenged. Labour to adopt the plan. Will you adopt National's plan? Look, I haven't had a chance to read it in great detail, and so I will um, reserve judgment on some of the aspects of that plan until I have had a chance to look at them. Um, it's clear that um, you know the National Party want to throw open the borders, have hundreds of thousands of people coming in. Therefore, one can conclude uh, that the biggest promise they're making at the moment is that they're willing for Kiwis to get COVID for Christmas. Uh, the reality here is that they haven't provided any modelling um, for the number of COVID-19 cases that they would be willing to tolerate or what they would do uh, in certain scenarios uh, because it would almost certainly result in significant numbers of cases in the community. They've given no indication of what they would do around managing that. Minister, have you had any information to suggest that there are people that are that people COVID positive that are, that are refusing to go into MIQ? No. Minister, Sorry, Jessica, I did say I'll come back to you. How fair is it to exclude sports people from that trial in MIQ? Because surely they'd be great candidates for it. I think what we will see in the new year, and we've talked about this before, um, is that some of the things that we might not have been willing to do previously, we would be willing to do uh, in the future. And that might include more of those bespoke MIQ arrangements. So sports teams uh, isolating in different environments to our, our typical MIQ environments. That's not going to happen this side of Christmas, I don't think. But in early in the new year, I think those sorts of possibilities will become more feasible than they have been. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. For, uh, teams visiting overseas, wouldn't sports people just be an obvious choice if they're going to fly the fern overseas? Shouldn't we be helping them to do that? They're typically coming in in larger numbers, um, and we are talking about 150 people for the pilot at this stage. Um, but, you know, look, we, we continue to talk to sports teams about what more we can do to, to support uh, sports teams being able to come into the country. I think Kiwis enjoy being able to, uh, to see sports at home, and they also take a great degree of pride in Kiwi sports people being able to compete internationally. Amelia. Just further to that, um, individual athletes are struggling to get spots in MIQ. Why are sports teams being prioritised over individual athletes? Um, in some cases, that, that it is quite difficult for sports teams to secure MIQ vouchers uh, in a way that's compatible with team-like activity. Uh, and so, yes, we do have to, and there's a very high threshold that we're talking about here, have some ability to be able to facilitate that uh, where it is justified. It, we're not talking large numbers. If you added up all of the um, the sort of allocations that we've made for things like sports teams, for um, various other things, uh, RSE and so on, if you added that all up together, it's less than a fortnight's worth of overall room allocation. So we are talking quite small numbers here. For those athletes who picked an individual sport, is it just tough luck, you picked the wrong sport, you don't get to go overseas to do your sport, whereas a sports team is able to do, do that because they have different criteria? Look, I think one of the things I'd be concerned about here is a suggestion that just because someone's uh, someone's in a sports team that they're they're getting they're jumping to the front of the queue uh, in order to be uh, to gain access to managed isolation. We're talking about a very small number of sports teams. Uh, they are they typically nationally representative sports teams. Uh, the All Blacks or the Black Caps, for example. Uh, it's not every sports team, and, and, and it's a very, very small number of sports teams. Just further to Jess's question, so um, on the um, individual athletes have been told that changes are coming. So is that what you sort of foreshadowed earlier in that they'll have to wait for the self-isolation next year, or what will those changes be and when will they be? Yeah, look, I haven't got anything to announce on that, but of course we're always looking um, at how we can do things differently. Uh, and I do think that things will look quite different in the early part of next year to what they are, to, to the way they look now. So what are the this is going on from the, uh, the RSC uh, isolation that's happening from Monday. Uh, what's the rules around uh, employers, just in case that people break the rules? Are there punishments? How is the Ministry of Health making sure that they're implementing this properly? Um, sorry, run that one past me again. So how how are, how's the Minister of Health making sure that RSC workers, employers, sorry, are implementing the self-isolation 
uh, period correctly, like if they're not breaking the rules? Look, we are seeing really good cooperation from our RSE worker employers. Um, they desperately need these workers for their business. They are absolutely committed to doing the right thing. Um, they're also very committed to making sure they have access to RSE workers in the future. Um, and so they know that their ability to, um, to have that access to those workers depends on them doing the right thing. So we're seeing a very good degree of cooperation there. Um, I don't know whether the Director General wants to add anything to that, but I am absolutely confident that those RSE worker employers um, are, are going to be doing the right things. Yes, so the DHBs will be supporting the testing of those workers, but the employers will be expected to, and I'm confident they'll have arrangements in place. In fact, the workers will, will be able to work as long as they stay within that bubble, and I'm sure that the employers will be ensuring that can happen by making sure they've got the food and other essential services they so need to... to Joe yeah. and then Derek, and then Henry. The housing crisis has been around longer than the COVID crisis has. We've seen growing emergency housing social wait lists growing for some time now. We've seen overseas where these particular housing structures have been problems for COVID. What forward planning and preparedness have you done around those communities with this outbreak? And in particular, to Dr. Bloomfield's point about going in and vaccinating people after they've been tested, what proactive forward planning was done around that in the first place? So I know that Minister Wood. Uh, Woods and Williams, um, as the responsible ministers around housing, have been doing a lot of work with those uh, emergency and transitional housing providers around vaccination and around ensuring that uh, there is access to vaccination for people in that situation, and then in fact that we get a good uptake uh, in that area. So you, you certainly um, would be, it would be good to put that question to them. But I'll ask the Director General whether he wants to comment on the work that Health have been doing as well. Certainly the DHBs uh, in all the major metropolitan areas where there is uh, emergency transition housing that has been part of their plans. In this case, of course, there's a, a, an, an opportunity because they're going in and testing. Uh, but remembering that people are often in this accommodation for short periods of time, and so it's picking them up through the full range of initiatives that are that are in the community is, is the most important. Yeah, in terms of that preparedness work, though, I mean, you, you could easily look to overseas and, and just to Australia even and see how much the, the spread there has been in, in this particular type of housing. So. I mean, I guess I'm just asking, you didn't know before how vaccinated this group of people are. Are you confident that the vaccination rates are high there and has a lot of work been put into ensuring that, given we know that it's an area that is going to be problematic? I don't have a readout on what the vaccination rates are for the uh, people in the in this accommodation. It will vary, but we can see if the DHB's got got and that information or is able to collect it. Because you would want it to be high, right, particularly in this style of housing. Uh, we'd want it to be high amongst all groups, but yes, and particularly in, in those who are um, who are in this situation, uh, that's absolutely right. And again, I'm confident that all the DHBs have had this as part of their plans. Derek. So a follow-on from that, the Drug Foundation has also talked about the need to go in and help people who have addiction issues who are often also quite transient. You know, if that work is also being done. I'll have to come back to you on that. Uh, I also wanted to ask if you uh, have any um, gauge on whether any... The, the vaccination uptake of ship pilots because that was a concern before we they would be vaccinated. Well, I haven't got a granular breakdown, but what I have had is sort of anecdotal feedback um, that, generally speaking, we've seen a much greater willingness to uptake vaccination amongst that workforce once more intensive one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations and briefings have been provided. And no exceptions granted to uh, Not... That not by me, uh, not that I'm aware of so far. I'll come back, I'll come back to you whether there's been any, any need for that. Um, we'll go to Claire and, and then... Are there any updated figures on how many in the current outbreak were vaccinated when they got COVID and whether or not they have been transmitting to other people? Uh, I gave an update, I think, on Monday with the proportions of, of all our cases, all the eligible um, people who are eligible for vaccination, the proportion who were vaccinated, and that was 68% uh, unvaccinated and just 4% fully immunised, that is, they're uh, two weeks since their last vaccination. Um, it's, it's not really, um, it's not straightforward then to find out how many of those who are vaccinated might have transmitted to others. That will be a piece of work that will be done as part of an analysis of the outbreak subsequently. So we might work our way along the back row and then finish with Henry. And National's calling the MIQ system a lottery of misery and says it could clear the backlog in a week. What do you make of those comments? Well, I mean, just to put those numbers into perspective, yes, there is a lot of additional demand 
um, for people wanting to come into the country. But simply throwing open the borders isn't a responsible way of dealing with that. To put that into perspective, uh, if we did reopen the border, you're talking about 12,500 people a day uh, who could come in, be coming across the border, about 385,000 people per month. Uh, they could be coming from all over the world. Uh, it would be very, very difficult to, identi to, to keep COVID-19 out in that, those circumstances. In fact, it would be impossible. We'd be giving up uh, on trying to keep COVID-19 out of the community. I know that the National Party uh, have talked about the UK, so let's put this into perspective. They haven't provided any modelling for what they are expecting in terms of case numbers uh, or hospitalisations as a result of their plan. But if we simply take them at their, wo their words, uh, which is that they're looking at the UK, uh, translated into uh, per head population comparison, that would see around uh, 16,000 cases, 460 hospitalisation and 54 deaths per week. Uh, if we were the UK, uh, based on a relative size of our population, that is what we would be dealing with. That's not what National's proposing, though. They're, not, they're saying if you are unvaccinated and you're not a Kiwi citizen or resident, you wouldn't be able to come to New Zealand, and they would only do that once there's 85% of the other people. But if, if you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of people coming into the country every month, uh, then the reality is COVID-19 will be coming with at least some of those people. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, just, a, just really quickly, same question uh, for Dr. Bloomfield that I asked before. Are you aware of anybody um, in Auckland during this outbreak that has refused to go to MIQ or has shown resistance, COVID-positive people? Uh, I'm not aware that of people that have refused to go, but I will, will say that in some circumstances, the Medical Officer of Health can agree that a person can isolate at home or in a place that is not their uh, not a managed isolation or quarantine facility, if there are good reasons. Sometimes that's because they need supports if they, for example, have a disability or a medical condition. Uh, and there may, may be other circumstances where actually the best place is for them to isolate uh, in their own home. And the Medical Officer of Health, who's the person on the ground, has the discretion to grant that exemption. How many of those cases are current? Uh, I, I will come back to you on that. It's a system, though. It is pretty miserable, isn't it? Oh, look, there's no doubt that restrictions at the border are having a significant impact on a number of New Zealanders, both here in New Zealand and abroad. There's no question about that. Uh, we're doing what we can do to safely accommodate people uh, who are coming and going from New Zealand and largely coming back to New Zealand. Um, but it is really difficult. I've never underestimated that. Um, and I do um, acknowledge that the, you know, it, it creates a difficulty. The reality, though, is that many of those people wanting to come to New Zealand from abroad, you know, come home to New Zealand for summer, for example, are looking at New Zealand and saying, New Zealand's a good place to be at the moment because we, we, have, we, we, would, we would have more freedoms in New Zealand than the place that we currently are because of the situation that New Zealand is in at the moment. And so giving away the advantages that we have in order to allow more people in uh, isn't going to leave, leave us better off. So lottery's in. You reckon you've got a better system than the last one? Um, I think it's fairer in the sense that everybody gets an equal shot. About 10,000 additional people will be coming home as a result of the two uh, rounds of room allocations that we have done using the lobby system. Uh, it has taken uh, the, the fastest finger, if you like, as aspect out of it, um, and it's meant that everybody is treated equally once they are in the lobby and they get an equal opportunity um, to be drawn out and, and have the opportunity to book. Well, we put more transparency in place to show how many rooms are available for each month which is one of the criticisms that the Kiwis overseas have experienced, and also the technical glitches where people do get in and then they have to refresh and they're dropped out of the queue and they miss out. Um, I haven't heard much on the technical glitches. Certainly happy to look at that. Um, and we could certainly look at whether it, it would be... Um, uh, whether we could release, for example, a breakdown of the month-by-month -month rooms that are being released in any given, uh, in any given ballot. I'm certainly happy to go away and have a look at that. Um, so I, I, you, have, you haven't had a question, so I'll come to you and then over to Henry. Thanks. Uh, on the uh, 12 cases from today, which have yet to be linked, is there any, anything that, any more information you have about them, any way that they, uh, are any of them associated with one another, for example, or anything like that? Uh, the only additional information I had before I came down was that for six of them, there appeared to be uh, a link to an existing case, and that was because they had used a serve code uh, with their test. But other than that, I don't have additional information uh, other than basic demographic information because the interviews are ongoing. So then there's a lot of tests as a result of, of being notified of, that they are a contact or something like that? that? That's correct. Or they may have been picked up through surveillance testing, uh, but um, 
certainly at the moment we know at least half of them had used a surveillance testing code. In, in one last of the, one of the things uh, Judith Collins was asked about today was uh, vaccine mandates for customers and whether she was comfortable with private businesses using them. Obviously, I think most people agree a concert, you know, they can make people get vaccinated to come in. Um, she said she'd be comfortable with airlines using it for domestic passengers and for supermarkets barring unvaccinated people from coming in as well. Is that something that the government would be comfortable with or is that a step too far? I think um, around airlines, I know that airlines are having those conversations and we are talking to the airlines about those uh, issues at the moment. Uh, and that's an international conversation that is happening. Um, uh, well, that is an international conversation that is happening and I imagine that that will spill through into domestic airline activity, not just here but around the world. In terms of supermarkets, I think the idea that you would deny people access to food because they're not vaccinated, I think, uh, might be a bit a step too far. You, oh, no, you, other, you didn't get a question, other... so I will let you have the last question. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, just a question for a colleague. So when an international athlete does seek an MIQ spot, what's the process and what criteria is used to determine their application? Uh, ultimately, if they're coming in under a, a, sport, a specific sporting allocation, um, then it has to be sponsored by the national sports organisation. It has to meet a very high threshold, which is, you know, the, the, the national significance threshold is quite a high one. Uh, therefore, the majority of people who are coming in through that, uh, who are coming in if they're, if they're leaving for sporting-related reasons, will be um, using the, the MIAS system, um, the same as everybody else's. Uh, it is a small number, as I said, that we're talking about through, the, the, um, through any other allocation system. Has is uh, vaccination stations outside nightclubs? Is getting um, <coughs> jabs outside clubs anything that you guys would entertain? Well, I'm not sure that when people are loaded up on alcohol, um, that that's necessarily the right environment to be safely administering vaccines. Any thoughts on that? Um, quick uh, well, my my uh, hope is that people will get will get vaccinated, uh, in, in particularly in, in Auckland, uh, before we're in a situation and and around the country where nightclubs are open again. And I would have thought that's a great motivation for people to be vaccinated, um, whatever age they are. All right, you definitely are the last Thank question. You. Um, will people have to provide ID alongside a vaccine certificate when they're rolled out in a domestic setting? So the. Um, That'll ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately be up to how the venues enforce uh, any rules, if, if there were any rules. Um, <clears throat> the vaccine certificate will have a person's name uh, on it. Uh, it will have uh, the ability to, to, check that, to check that against the, the database to make sure it's a, a, an authentic vaccine certificate uh, using QR code technology. So the person checking it would be able to scan that QR code and check the name against the name that's on the database for that QR code, if that makes sense. Um, so therefore stopping people just taking someone else's QR code and manufacturing their own vaccine certificate. Um, it would be wise, of course, to check that the name that someone is presenting with is actually their name. And so they may ask for some other form of identification for that purpose. All right, thanks everybody. <coughs>